Bullshit. Let's pretend for a moment we've entered a parallel universe, free of bullshit marketing and full of bold solutions. That's what the Don't Be a Bullshit Marketer podcast is all about. Our guest today is Jerry Zahorchak, a lifelong educator who served as the Pennsylvania State Secretary of Education, led multiple school districts as superintendent, and throughout his career has done just about every key position in a school system, including teacher, principal, football coach, federal programs director, and strategic planning coordinator. <coughs> and our sights and sounds of marketing is No Reply at All by Genesis, taking us back to 1981 and the beginnings of MTV and the end of one of the most famous news anchors of all time. But first, let's cut the bullshit. I was talking with a prospective new client who reached out to me to see if Mass Solutions could help his company. He said he wasn't satisfied with the firm he used to use for messaging, PR, and marketing. I asked why or what he thought that firm was or wasn't doing. He said, they didn't listen to me and my team, and they didn't come up with any creative ideas. And even when we gave them ideas, they didn't get things done when they said they would. Now, there are two sides to every story, and we're only hearing his, but the bottom line is he and his team are unhappy and looking for a new strategic partner. My second question was, what made you buy from them? What was the deciding factor? His response bothered me. Your counterpart at that company kept telling me that he and his team would do everything. Whatever I said, he responded with, we can do that. We're great at that. But once we started working together, they didn't deliver. By the way, that's actually a pretty good imitation of this guy. Uh, whether it's a B2B or B2C company, whether for-profit or not-for-profit, whether you're selling products or services, it, this is a common problem. And it's bullshit. BS selling and BS buying. As sellers, we need to ask questions, listen to the prospect's wants and needs, then needs match where possible. But we also need to be transparent to the prospect and honest with ourselves. We aren't always the best option for each and every service or product. Kidding ourselves and leading the prospect on is simply bad business. Making BS promises might land a short-term sell, but come on, man, it's going to catch up with you. Dissatisfied customers lead to bad word of mouth, operational issues trying to meet their needs, sales time working to try and turn things around, and on and on. From a buyer standpoint, though, you can't be wild by style over substance. Ask tough follow-up questions, ask for references, and actually call them. Build an action plan up front with clear expectations. Expect the seller to meet the deliverables and communicate openly throughout the relationship. Jerry, have you had a previous experience where someone offered you BS promises? You bet. Um, and, and, you know, I, it is a two-way street. I, I used to think just playing harsh with anybody selling you anything was the idea uh, from someone who owns the purse strings or who can control whether or not uh, people would be uh, working with you. But in maturing, you, you know, you really do find out um, that relationships are two-way communications. And if you're not clear about what you're looking for and think somebody's magically going to come in and produce <laughs> something that gives you uh, all the results you didn't know you were looking for but makes you great, um, not going to happen. So the, the customer, in this case me, uh, I've had times where looking back I'm thinking, I was more than part of the problem, probably was the problem, just because I'm not clear enough. Uh, and that goes with uh, purchasing just about any, in any vendor um, client relationship. If you're not certain, and then on the other hand, you know, I think sometimes uh, the computer software sells where they have a, they have a set program and you're either going to squeeze yourself into it. It's like Cinderella's yeah. sisters trying to get into the yeah. shoes. You know, you're either going to squeeze yourself into that uh, and change your whole dynamic, or they're going to be honest with you and say, look, we'd have to customize. You have to actually buy a programmer to get what you want. So I've had the experiences uh, uh, both in uh, communications, software purchases, and on and on and on, yes. where you know, you're just not satisfied with that relationship, and you start to think, uh, just as your uh, client uh, that you were imitating, you know, you start to think, yeah, the problem is uh, communications uh, yeah. with the relationship you're about to get into because it's a dance. And if you trust someone, 
uh, a company that says, you know, we probably can have a good relationship because we're not the end all be all. But if we can work with you and you work with us, we can probably do a lot together and get things done. I wonder how many times I've lost a sell because my team gets frustrated with me because I point out I'm so transparent about the potential pitfalls because we are in a field that while it's an art and a science, marketing, PR, messaging, it's an art and a science. It's still more art than science. Maybe science is 40%, 60% is art. So it's not like when we would purchase an MRI for UPMC and we could do our break-even analysis and pretty much know we were going to get there. So I'm often too transparent. I will start pointing out, hey, this could happen, this could happen. And my team's like, shut up already. So, yeah. you know, but I really believe that the, the substance over style matters. And this particular company that this guy is leaving to come with us, they do sometimes get business and, I, and it is from the talk. It is from the talk. And, and I'd rather back it up. I'd rather not get, you know, I'd rather get four instead of seven clients, but we kicked butt for, for three of the four and did okay for the fourth rather than get all seven and have three or four of them talking like this gentleman. So, but Jerry, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. And you, as I said earlier, your background, what I like about, and I want to touch on this throughout the talk today is that you've done pretty much everything in uh, public education uh, and all the way from starting out as a teacher and doing some coaching and then principal, then superintendent, but then the state secretary of education for Governor Rendell, uh, and then came back to your hometown as superintendent of Greater Johnstown School District, a large uh, urban district, and you've also done strategy. So you've done the whole gamut, and I think that brings a lot to our listeners. So I want to make sure we talk about some of the different things that, uh, that you've experienced. So you heard my cut the bullshit rant. Let's get right to it. We both talked a little bit about how we have to communicate, but give me an example or your definition, I should say. What is your definition of bullshit marketing? Yeah, I think the, the BS marketing is is simple for me to think about. You know, it's when someone is doing what we talked about just minutes ago. It's, it's a promise of everything. We can do that. We can do that. That should be the first clue. If you're hearing we can do that to everything you say before you even really clearly define what you're looking for, that's the, that's a signal that somebody's BSing you right away just to get a sale, not to get a relationship, and not to really help you do what you're trying to do. And I think that's the opposite of BS marketing is when somebody says, I want to know why you're doing what you're doing and what is it, what's your purpose and, and what is it that you're trying to accomplish. And then I can determine whether or not we can help you do that. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about over-promising as BS marketing. I think that's a big piece of BS marketing. I also think that... Uh, not listening as well uh, can be BS marketing. And then something you and I are both passionate about is over communicating is, is good marketing. So when someone under communicates, it's BS marketing. You and I both uh, strive to be good communicators, but I'm going to put you on the spot because looking back, when do you think that you might have been a bullshit marketer or that you did uh, something that you look back and say, eh, I could have communicated better? Uh, what's your biggest, say, communications messaging failure and what did you learn that our listeners can take from it? Yeah, I think with me and my behavioral type, uh, sometimes sh pulling the trigger, and, and I love ready, fire, aim, uh, but sometimes the aim could be a little better done before the trigger gets pulled. So I think the uh, prematurity of, of, uh, of your rolling out when you're really not ready is times when I've marketed things and almost biting my lips saying, I know darn well we don't have the substantive stuff behind me that I'm saying we do. And when I do that, you know, not a, you know, kidding everyone. And maybe we can build the uh, you know, plane while it's in flight, but it's you're better off, I think, not doing that. And those were times when I caught myself in trouble. Listening to that, uh, if it's a balanced relationship in an organization at the top making sure that the yin and yang uh, are, are both communicating equally and both giving the nod that it's re you know something's ready to go in the marketing sense. Okay. So you sort of touched on your definition of marketing, uh, and I want to make sure I give you a chance to go thoroughly through what your definition of marketing is because I joke that if, when we ask 100 people 
what their definition of marketing is, we typically get about a hundred different <laughs> definitions. So, it sounds like curriculum development in schools. Yeah, you know? Yes. So <laughs> what I, is I, curriculum? I, you know, so curriculum. I want to hear your uh, your definition of marketing. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, you use terms, and I hear them all the time from you, uh, we have uh, public relations, and we can build that public relations with people we're related to. In my business, you know, we have public relations with parents. It's a different public when it's with teachers or internal folks. It's a different public when it's with our property owners. It's a different public when it's with our business community. And sometimes those do intersect. But the understanding the public relations is that partnership building is what I'm thinking of it as, where we say we can do some things together and we want to have a relationship with you, whatever public you fit into. And then the marketing, I think, gets into two folds. Can we broadcast market? And that's, you know, scattershot. Um, and can we target? And if we have a specific group that we're trying to do something for as part of our market, we know exactly who they are and we know exactly how they'll respond. So, you know, I'm thinking right now, sometimes that's even generational. If I'm talking to a millennial, it's different than talking to an Xer. It's different than talking to a boomer. Um, and do I know the target? Uh, so target marketing, marketing, and then separate from that, uh, public relations. So I would make definitions for those. I like it. I like it a lot. So I've had the chance to see you market and communicate even before uh, the the second time at Johnstown when we had the opportunity to actually work together. But we've known each other for many years, and I, I observed, and then I remember when you were with Governor Rendell, we had a couple of opportunities to talk. Give me an example of what you think, and you've had so many of them, so it might be hard, but what is your most memorable marketing, messaging, or communications? It could be any of those three, success as a leader. What's your most memorable success uh, from a marketing, messaging, or communications standpoint? Yeah, I thought the way we build, and this is really technical, technical, so principals and superintendents will understand exactly what I'm talking about. Teachers may have some familiarity, and anybody outside those circles will probably be uh, a, a bit uh, confused or behind the eight ball in this conversation. But when we built something called Act 45, it's also known as Pennsylvania Inspired Leadership Policy, we took time from conceptual idea that leadership development has to be different in our space. The support and the expectations we have for continuous education, continuous development has to be better defined. So we gathered a group of, uh, of people from all kinds of uh, interest groups. So from school boards to um, the teachers association, to the principals association, the superintendents association, higher education, uh, who have the responsibility oftentimes uh, the intermediate units. So we gathered a large group of uh, rather diverse interest in the same topic, school leadership, and how we could change. What, what was previous was something that we said was you show up and you have to continue your education and have so many credits or hours. And it, it was more or less showing up, signing your name and getting the hours. And we thought we can do better than that. We can target certain topics we can make sure that people go deep. We can make them bring back product that they actually apply what they learn, and we can change the dynamics. Well, we had a really great success. One, we greased all the skids so when the legislature begins to act on whether or not they're going to accept the proposal from the Department of Education for a change in legislation requiring principals and superintendents to behave differently with continuing education, all the skids were greased because we took about a year with those interest leaders and everybody's hat uh, was uh, present and everyone's ideas and, you know, arguments were made. And when we came to it, not everyone, no one had everything they thought they wanted, but they participated. And that kind of participation with the marketing process made it easy when we did finally land at the legislature to get something that now will be sustained for a long time because the process was more of a quality process than it was uh, a dictatorial one. Talking with Jerry Zahorchak, who has uh, had just about every position in education as superintendent, teacher, principal, and was the uh, Pennsylvania Secretary of Education, just gave a great summary of a successful marketing messaging and communications experience for you. And what I take away, it goes back to your definition. You lived your definition. You narrowed down a bunch of different target markets. You made sure you had target markets involved with creating the message. And then you had that message tweaked 
uh, to go to each of the target markets that it had to go out to and then that's, implement it. That's right, David. And when we got to people like you who were going to do the press and communication on this, it was so simple for them because the substantive stuff was so well done that we had something we could say to our friend, the, the mm -hmm. uh, public relations or the marketing expert, mm -hmm. this is what it is, and here's how we see it. So when we started talking to principals, unbeknownst to the field, was this massive change. But a communication became easy because we really had it well defined. Excellent. Excellent example. So that kind of segues nicely into the next segment because this gives you a chance to kind of tell me a little bit about your story now that you are, uh, you, you retired from Greater Johnstown School District as a superintendent. You've got a lot of ideas and a lot of energy and you're young, so you are going to continue to do things. But what you've heard me say this probably a hundred times because we're both Vistage members. We've, we've been, uh, we're both involved with the Johnstown community, which we both grew up there and we're trying to continually grow that. But you've heard me say and challenge clients or whether it's a, a leader who has to make a speech, I say, what's the big idea? And I'm playing off of the old phrase, what's the big idea? But what's the big idea? What's the main takeaway? The one thing that you want that audience to, to walk away with out of your message. And so with you, I want you to just pick whatever you want. It could be your, uh, your big idea when you were at Johnstown, or it could be your big idea now that you're moving on to cooler and newer things, not cooler, but cool things and new things. Or it could be, hey, here's an example of what the big idea was when I was working for Governor Rendell. So, Jerry, what's the big idea? Yeah, what we did was come together and, uh, you know, from the time I first met uh, the governor uh, to the time we had our last session together as I was exiting and he was about to exit, uh, we thought that every single child in the Commonwealth, there's 1.8 million, could be known by name. And we could expect every child to succeed academically, to graduate from high school, regardless of their background, where they come from, their condition, whether they have a disability, their circumstances, their own home. Um, every child, by name, being that successful. And we would start out, I would start out everywhere I went with that as the opener. You know, and it gave you the idea. And when I was, you know, in front of parents, you know, you saw them. I was talking about their child because we were going to know that person by name. And you'd see the head nods and the affirmation. And it was the same with uh, our educators and everyone else. People came up under that umbrella of a big idea. And then we started to get, you know, what do we have to do uh, to make that happen? That's really cool. And, and what I'm going to do, Jerry, is I'm going to let you have a little time to ponder this while we go on to another question. But eventually, I want you to tell me a funny Ed Rendell story, because I think he's one of those people that I've met him two or three times. And, and you just he, he he's like someone that when you meet him, you're the only one in the room. He shakes your hand. You're the only one. In the room. And there's always everybody always has their funny Ed Rendell story. So you can you can wait and give me that in a minute. Uh, and, 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 I, and we'll come back to that. But make sure you, you can think about which one you want to use. So now let's talk about uh, we talked about what your definition of marketing is, how you've been successful by applying that and what your big idea was when you were conveying that message as the Secretary of Education for the state of Pennsylvania. So now it's time to kind of be the educator that you are and pick a tool or a tip that you'd offer to someone that will help them either tell their story or help them communicate as a leader, craft their message. Uh, what's your tip or tool for our audience? Yeah, not to, uh, I think the best tip in thinking about this is not to knee-jerk response, and especially in a crisis, to, to really get out of your own way, get with experts and people who know how to communicate, and with substantive, whatever the issue is, make sure you're pulling all the information in. Take enough time, and hopefully that fits into a design or a context that says, this is where we go, this is how we do it, this is what we do afterwards. You already thought that through long before in this crisis management. One of the worst mistakes folks can make is just thinking, well, I can go out there and handle it uh, by, you know, winging it or in a flippant kind of way. That kind of uh, capricious response gets people either stunned and they look like deers and headlight or deer and headlights, or uh, it gets them saying things that, uh, you know, is going to be picked up on a one liner that's mm -hmm. going to be used uh, and abused. So the practice prior to um, going out there and before the practice, the really organizing your thoughts 
uh, and with other people. You know, communications is almost like legal systems, you know, where if you think you're going to be the main communicator for yourself, it's like hiring yourself. Lincoln, I think, said it, hiring a, a lawyer who hires himself. There's two dumb people in the room, the client and the lawyer, you know. Yes. Um, so, so you have to be uh, you have to really be careful uh, when responding, especially in a crisis. Well, I think working personally with you, we have a couple of examples and I won't get into all the specifics so we won't violate any client uh, details. But uh, a couple of times the school district was hit with something that was a crisis situation. And you and I were able to talk and you were able to bring in uh, Mike Vukovic and other key people at your uh, district and we would build a plan and you would follow that plan and you had success and you would have success in the initial news cycle and the second or third cycle. But there was one instance and you'll probably remember it. There was a, a person that spoke at a meeting and uh, went off script completely. And then the next day, the headline, you called me and said, do you believe this? And we were both like, where was he going with that? So it plays to your point about someone had a had not a script. That's the wrong word to use. But what we try to do is prepare talking points for for our clients, and we we role play with them and say, what if someone would ask you this? Which could be a community member. What if a teacher asked you? What if the reporter asked you? And you and I had your team there, and we walked through everything that was going to be said. And the next day, just started winging it at the uh, at the meeting in front of the TV, and it was a disaster. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Self control is uh, is hard. And same with controlling the message, you know, because, you know, you think and you have thousands of thoughts going on while someone's talking with you and you might start to chase something that isn't in the controlled message and you go off and uh, it's sometimes unrecoverable. And even when people do it around you, you have to, you know, I always say uh, I'm not going to uh, admire their problem too long. Just pointing it out, we we could do better when we control the message. It becomes like you say, a teachable yes. moment. Absolutely, absolutely. So now, have you had time to think of an Ed Randell story before we go into the sites? And My gosh, uh, there's there's so, <laughs> there's so many of them. His you know his Christmas party or creating the Harrisburg chapter of the Punxsutawney Phil Society. You know. Uh, it, I remember the bus, though. Uh, you know, when you'd ride on the bus with Ed Rendell on an issue, he he would uh, have so much uh, enjoyment and fun and keep an energy level up. He was almost like the person in charge of keeping the energy high. If it wasn't talking about the meatball sandwiches the bus driver prepared and the fact that we all had to eat them uh, or, uh, you know, <laughs> do, doing Godspell and doing the animations for the musical. <laughs> uh, I mean, just so many cool things. But you're right about when he, he could have 350 people in the room and maybe left you 10 minutes ago, but you, it feels like he's still standing by you. Yes. You know, he brings such a presence. He's so retail. Yes. In his uh, politics, you know, I mean, back to the bus rides, he would be doing the Godspell, making someone have a, the, the extra meatball and uh, he'd be on his cell phone and talking about, you know, raising funds with uh, some, uh, you know, national person that was going to help them uh, do something. And, and meanwhile, uh, probably the most painful Ed Rendell I ever saw was when he first started to learn to text. And he was an early, you know, early guy, but the young kids that were on the staff would zip him a text and he would just, you know, it would be like a long time. And then he would go out and bing, it came right back from them. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, he was just a, a, a remarkable human being that I'm uh, pleased I've had the experience of, uh, blessed to have the experience of working alongside him in a really close relationship for seven plus years. What bothers me about the partisan world we live in is, you know, when you have someone like Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton or Ed Rendell or George Bush, these people are so charismatic in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Now, some of them are charismatic at the podium, but George Bush is a great example of someone who he also made you feel like you were the only person there and maybe he wasn't as good on the podium as a Clinton, but those four them naming three are presidents, one's a governor, but it doesn't matter to me as a message guy. I don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican. I love those guys that are able to communicate well, both one to one. and one I, to I think the whole nation recently enjoyed Clinton and Bush W yes. on the, on a, a set with a commentator and the, the, the work they did together, um, you know, uh, having fun, yes. looking back and looking forward yes. at an eventual potential Clinton-Bush race. But they were just having a ball. 
And that's what America wants to see, I think, Dave. I think so, too. That kind of good relationship, good communication, yes. um, and all that other stuff aside. Well, that's awesome. Sights and sounds of marketing. Let's do some sights and sounds of marketing because I want to go back in time. You might have been coaching, which we'll get, some, we'll get to talk about that. Uh, but this episode, Sights and Sounds of Marketing, begins with the song, No Reply at All by Genesis. Uh, so what I do is I try to take some of the lyrics and apply them to marketing, messaging, communications, and so forth. But it talks about talk to me. You never talk to me. We've all experienced that person who just won't return our calls. They won't respond to our emails or they won't speak up in meetings so we don't know where their thoughts are. Uh, look at me. You never look at me. You're looking through me like I wasn't here at all. No reply. There's no reply at all. Notice I just read it because I can't sing a lick. Uh, still, maybe the worst are painful meetings where meaningful conversation and clear direction are non-existent. And the meeting just goes on and on, achieving nothing. I get the feeling you're trying to tell me, is there something that I should know? Or there are messages that are filled with generalities and corporate cliches. We talked about Bush and Clinton. Uh, they would speak in key messaging rather than cliches for the most part. And that's why Reagan was a great communicator. He could hit the key message in eight words or less. Uh, what excuses are you trying to sell me? Should I be reading stop or go? I don't know. Confusion and ambiguity rather than clarity. Confusion and ambiguity rather than clarity. Is anybody listening? Maybe not. As leaders, we need to build a plan to over-communicate with clear, succinct, consistent messaging repeated multiple times and in multiple ways. We also need to make it about them. Think about how your target audiences that you referred to, Jerry, want to communicate. You talked about millennials, Generation X, boomers. Adjust to their style. It doesn't matter who's the boss or who has the authority. It's about the over-communicator realizing that they need to tweak their style and approach to match the wants and needs of their audience. Jerry, any thoughts on no reply at all, internal messaging and over-communicating? Yeah, I think the over-communication, you know, we both read lots of Lincioni's leadership stuff. And one of the, one of the four obsessions, uh, one of the four obsessions is once you know your design and what you have substantively, and once you have the team behind you, you, you have to make sure that consistently you're communicating the same message that about the design and you're doing it to many uh, stakeholders and over and over and over. Because remember, just like me and anybody else, when we're in a conversation, it's probably taking away for long-term 10% of what we heard. So if we don't hear it again, we're only going to be stuck with the 10%. And that could get us as you know potential participants uh, to become a problem for you when you thought you, and this is a term teachers use all the time, is, well, I covered that. Uh, yeah, you have to make sure people discovered what you were covering. Yes. And that takes time because in cover, in the dictionary of Webster, if you look up the word cover, it's hide from view. So overly communicating is the opposite of covering. It's making sure it's in clear view and constantly doing it so that 100% is known. Uh, that's when you have good communication. So I, I was thinking about over communications when you were saying that. I'm also thinking about no reply at all. I think the worst thing in the people to people business, and that's what we're in, uh, all of us, is that you stop communicating or you don't give me the satisfaction of a response. Even if you want to just call and say, I don't have time to talk with you. Yes. And the answer, by the way, is no, but call me again with the next idea. We'll stay yes. friends. You know that stuff. Exactly. I love the line about make sure your target audience discovers what you covered. Uh, tying back to the teacher thinking that they covered that. We always get the same thing here. Like we talked about that in the meeting. Make sure the target audience understood it. Discover, make sure the audience discovered what you covered. So with the sights and sounds of marketing, 1981 was no reply at all by Genesis. In that time, there were some other messaging hits maybe some misses, maybe even some BS messaging or BS marketing from 1981. But a new cable network, Music Television, kicked off with a promotion featuring rock stars saying, I want my MTV. That was my Billy Idol one. So that was my favorite one, Billy Idol with, I want my MTV. Uh, General Electric's ad campaign used the tagline, GE, we bring good things to life. And that's the way it is. Walter Cronkite signs off from CBS News for the last time. Hill Street Blues introduced a new format for television dramas featuring multiple storylines in each episode and close-held camera cuts. Sergeant Esterhouse introduced his trademark line, let's be careful out there. You're on the spot, Jerry. Which of these sights and sounds from 1981 
are the most memorable? Geez, that's the way it is. Uh, you know, concrete was a, a extraordinary, uh, and uh, yeah, that was a brand. Sure was. He was amazing. And then Hill Street Blues was sort of based on uh, uh, the Hill Street Hill District here in Pittsburgh, so that's why I wanted to make sure I get that in there, uh, since we're Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania based. But yes, Walter Cronkite, that's the way it is. Uh, amazing career, amazing communicator. You want to talk about no BS. Mm. Well, thanks for joining us, Jerry. Uh, quick thanks question for, for you. Uh, how can listeners contact you if they'd like to learn more about what you do? Yeah, so uh, my email is jerryz8551. That was my college and high school football numbers, 85 and 51, at yahoo.com. So jerryz8551. Or I'm on LinkedIn, and I tweet at jerryz8551. Uh, so th those are ways to uh, get in touch with me, um, and I'd love to be uh, in touch with people. That's what I that's what I do. Excellent. Well, thanks again, Jerry, and thank you for joining us, uh, our audience, uh, for "Don't Be a Bullshit Marketer," your Bold Solutions podcast. Visit boldsolutionsnobs.com for show notes plus additional marketing and messaging resources. Are you signed up for light reading? You'll receive proven strategies every other week to improve your marketing and transform your message. It really is light, intended to be read in two minutes or less, and it just might trigger bright ideas for you. To sign up, visit masssolutions.biz slash blog. Remember, ask yourself, what's the big idea? And build your story around the answer. It's all about bold solutions without the...